You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Saturday and Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on KLRN Radio and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at r-a-h-a-r-d-i-n dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Each of my programs are being saved so that you can listen to them at any time. There's just four simple steps to find the past programs. Go to www.spreaker.com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. Enter my name, Richard Harden, in the search box in the top center of the home page. Click on the brown icon, which has the Bible, two candlesticks, and a cross in the background. A list of my programs will come up. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Welcome to God's Pure Word of Faith. I'm Richard Harden, and again, I want to thank the Lord and the management of KLRN Radio for this great opportunity to share God's Word with you today. In the last message, uh, Ministers number one, I shared with you from Ephesians 4, that uh, verses 4 to 5, that we're supposed to have one faith in our society. We're supposed to have one faith uh, because God's not going to tell us all different things about, you know, the meanings of different scriptures and things like this. He's going to tell us all the same. And we'll have one calling in our lives. 2 Timothy 1 9, he saved us and called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, but our, our purpose, but according to his own purpose and grace created in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now we all have this special holy calling. I don't care who you are, God has something very special for you to do here on earth during your time. And we have to seek him to, well, find that holy calling. Uh, it's not just dumped on us, but it's also evil for us not to seek him. In Second uh, Chronicles chapter 14, it says that Rehoboam, Solomon's son, did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. So, so we're each responsible for working out our salvation and seeking God's will for us and finding out and what our service is that he wants us to do during this time here on earth. And that should be the highest priority in all of our lives. Now, as we do that, each of us then, the only way we can please God is by responding to faith. In um, Hebrews 
chapter 11, verse 6 says, uh, Without faith it is impossible to please God. So there's no other way because see, faith is when we hear God's word, we must respond positively to receive his word into our heart for it to be faith. If we reject his word, it's unbelief, like the children of Israel in Hebrews chapter 3. When they rejected his will to cross over the Jordan because they didn't trust God enough that he would take care of them and deliver them from the spies, I mean, deliver them from the giants and everything in the land, they didn't trust him enough to accept his will and his word to faith. And it says that they were departing from the living God to unbelief. And that's what unbelief is, is when you reject God's will or word for you, you're rejecting God himself because when he manifests a message to us, it's God himself manifesting his spirit in our mind to create what we call like a message or a thought or something like this so we can understand what he wants us to do. So when he speaks to us, it's God himself, the living God that we're rejecting when uh, we turn and, and don't follow whatever it is he's you know, manifested to us. So... Uh, we either have to accept his words in our heart to faith or reject them to unbelief. And he's promised to bring everybody to salvation. And he's promised to bring everybody to a knowledge of him. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says we're all without excuse because he's manifested himself even throughout creation and everything. And Titus 2.11 says that the grace of God that bring us salvation appeared to all men. So <clears throat> we're each personally responsible in for our own decisions and everything. But now, as each of us join together in receiving God's word in our life and we're seeking God's uh, special calling for us, he's going to put us together in the body of Christ in a way that the, uh, everybody will be blessed or edified in the Lord, built up in Christ, and, and we'll be sharing and working together and growing. And Ephesians 6.16 says, uh, talking about a shield of faith, well, each of us should be walking daily by faith, accepting and obeying God's word. And as each of us start doing that then, our country would have such a shield of faith that, you know, the onslaughts of the devil coming through, you know, uh, people trying to take, well, not trying, but taking, you know, God out of our public displays and everything and taking, you know, manger scenes out of Christmas and, and not allowing chaplains to pray in the name of Jesus and stuff like this. See, all these... Um, evil things that the devil is bringing against Christianity in our society and around the world, if we're all starting to you know walk by faith and join hand in hand, there'd be such a, a great shield of faith in our country. But right now our country is is in bad shape, and a lot of the reason is because of the the errors being taught in our society that. People claim are from the scriptures, but I want to show you some of these and uh, just see what you think about them, and you can make up your own minds. Like one of the things, you know, like today I'm going to be talking primarily about grace and uh, mercy, but one of the things is when, when you think about grace so often, you know, minister, everybody say, well, yeah, God's unmerited favor, but that's not correct. Romans 2 4 says, God blesses lost people to draw them to repentance. Now, that is God's mercy on the lost people, his, his favor to them, even when they're in re, you know, uh, rebellion and, and rejecting him, the lost people, but also for Christians who are you know, out of fellowship with God and not seeking his will and you know, not walking as we should or something. Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says God blesses lost people or you know unrepentant people like that to draw them to him. That's his unmerited favor. Now, grace the just a simple answer to it and everything. If you look up in the dictionaries and everything, it'll it'll be so confusing to you because it'll mix it grace is this thing and it'll it'll say something and then it'll say that it's mercy describes this and then when you look up mercy it'll use grace to describe it, you know, intermingling the definition so much and, and you can't do that when you define something. To define a word you must define it in a specific way that no other word can you know mean that it's about like a patent lawyer you know you got to be very exacting and everything so the simple definitions of these words you should look in the bible and for, for an example this morning 
to start out with, I want to share with you about mercy and grace from the scriptures. Luke chapter 10, verse 17, where it tells about the uh, uh, Good Samaritan story. And when, after Jesus told the story and everything, he uh, turned to the lawyer there, or he turned to the people and said, who to, you know, uh, who was the neighbor to this hurt man that was laying on the side of the road that needed help and everything? Now, if you're not familiar with that story, it's Luke chapter 10, um, around verse 17. But anyway, the lawyer replied, he that showed mercy. Now, what he was showing here was this, this man had helped a guy beside the road that needed, uh, you know, that was hurt, had been robbed and beat up and left laying there. And he didn't ask the man, you know, to make a deal with him. And I'll, you'll have to pay me back someday or something like this. Uh, but he just did everything he could to help him. A one-way type love, not expecting anything in return. And it's the same in Luke chapter 6 where Jesus tells us to pray for those that despitefully use us. You know, uh, bless those that curse you. You know, give to the poor, not expecting your return. Things like this. You know, one-way love, regardless of how the person re you know, responds to you, something like this. That's mercy. And now, in the Old Testament, Psalms 25.10 says, Mercy and truth are all the ways of the Lord to those that obey His testimonies and covenants. So, God's love to them and on them. And His word, truth is word. Jesus says in John 17.17, 17, Thy word is truth. Uh, so, it's mercy and truth in the Old Testament. And in our lives today, before we receive Christ in our heart, it's just like the Old Testament people. We're all born without any of God's Spirit in our heart. So His love on us and His Word to us, you know, and speaking to us and sending messages and like this. So that is mercy. And also in Isaiah 59 21, God says, This is my covenant with them, that my Spirit will be upon them and my words in their mouth. See, that's the same thing that uh, Psalms will say, mercy and truth. His Spirit on us and His words in our mouth. That's the mercy and that's a condition of like the people of the Old Testament and condition of people today before they receive Christ in their heart. That's God's mercy, one way love to them. Now, when we respond to that love and like uh, He's blessing lost people to draw them to repentance when, when a person responds to God's love and then uh, accept that they're a sinner and that Jesus is the answer for the sin and they must humble themselves. Well, when they cry out into God and say, Oh, Lord, please forgive me. Uh, come into my heart and save me. See, then, responding positively to God's word that we're a sinner, that we need Jesus, that Christ, you know, Jesus is the answer and that we must humble ourselves. And then when we actually do it, invite him to come into our heart then, Jesus says in John 6, 63, my words are spirit in their life. So when they come in their heart, then we're receiving his love, his spirit into our heart. Then the living word in our heart creates in us a new heart, a new life, and he lives in our heart. See, that's a work of grace there. Grace is only the work of the spirit in our hearts. Uh, you know, to at, well, at salvation, to create in us a new heart, a new life, and we become a child of God then because he puts his spirit in us and his spirit stays in us and lives in us. We're his child now. We're born into the family of God. That's what it means to be born again. And so when this happens, then see, grace is the work of God's spirit in our heart. Mercy, like it said in Isaiah, um, the covenant is my spirit upon them. You know, like protecting us or working on us and around us, you know, helping us and things like that, external to our heart. But that's a difference in mercy and grace. Um, and there's no intermingling of them, you know, because once you receive God's word to faith into your heart, for by grace are you saved through faith, then it's a work of grace in us. Now, in, in looking through some of these, uh, well, first, let me share with you just a little bit here about the, Bible in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, grace is used 67 times, and it was um, interpreted wrong, or you know, transcribed wrong, because there was no grace in the Old Testament. 67 times, and if you look up in the concordance and like this, 
each of those 67 times the grace in the Old Testament was actually talking about some kind of favor from God, kindness, uh, pleasantness, and see, favor to a person, on a person, kindness and things like this, external to the person's heart, that's mercy. So every time in the Old Testament that uh, the word grace is used, or gracious, or you know, graciously, or just any form of the word grace used in the Old Testament, it should have been favor, kindness, uh, precious, or or pleasantness, something like this. It never should have been interpreted grace. Now, because in uh, well, John one seventeen says, uh, grace and truth came by Jesus. You know, no one in the Old Testament had God's Spirit in their heart. None of them. You know, had the cleansed new heart. Well, Ezekiel 36, 26, God said the new um, covenant that we would have would be, he says, it would create you a new heart and give you a new spirit, and I'll put my spirit in you, and I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you, see. So it, he's given us a totally new heart when Christ comes in and cleans up and, and changes us inside, we get a totally cleansed new heart, and he puts his spirit in us, and he lives in us now. See, now that's that's the work of grace, and they didn't have that in the Old Testament. Some of them had anointings, and some of them had the spirit in them for a short while, but they didn't ever have the new heart and become a child of God like the uh, work of grace in the New Testament. Now, also then... Uh, Favor, you know, that goes along with, you know, Psalms 25.10 where it says, Grace, let's see, Psalms 25.10, All the ways of the Lord are mercy and truth, and such as keep his covenants and testimonies. So all of godly people in the Old Testament, they just had his love on them, uh, to them, and not in them. Now, uh, one of the problems here is that uh, Pastor John Hagee down in... Uh, San Antonio, he teaches that anybody that says there's no grace in the Old Testament is scripturally illiterate. But yet, the prophet Isaiah, you know, God spoke through him and, and stated that, uh, um, as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart from thy mouth. Now see, that was God's covenant in the Old Testament, everything. There was no grace in the Old Testament. Now, God's love, you know, his mercy and everything, the same mercy that we have today uh, was in the Old Testament, but not the work of grace in their hearts. That came by Jesus. And the first time people received the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts was on the day of Pentecost, when he, because it was a resurrection Spirit of Christ, the Apostle Peter says, that saves us and, you know, it creates in us a new heart, a new life at salvation. Now, there's, there's other things that people are, you know, teaching about grace and things. It's just confusing. But I'm share a lot of these scriptures now. And um, and remember, in Ezekiel 36, 26, the new covenant, the promise of the Spirit, he says, A new heart also will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my Spirit in you. That's the promise of the Spirit that he was talking about in the Old Testament. To the people that was going to take place in the future, and now, and that's for us. Well, so there's a big difference in grace and uh, mercy. Unmerited favor is God's mercy to lost people. In Romans chapter two, verse four, where He says, "I'll bless them and draw them to repentance." You know that, that He didn't try to beat up people. To get them to accept him, he wants us to do it because of his love and everything. Uh, in uh, well, let's see. I, w I went to a bookstore here recently, and there's a huge book in there about grace. It's from uh, Dr. Wayne Grudem or something like that from Phoenix. He's a translator, president of Evangelistic Theological Society. Fifty dollar book, and thirteen of the biggest names in our U.S. Christianity, and, and a part of the 13 of the largest ministries, I you know, started looking through there and looked up grace. And started looking at it. He teaches that there's two graces. There's two graces. It says one common grace for, uh, you know, well, common people or lost people, and one grace for Christians. 
you know, that can't be true because, see, grace is when the Spirit of Christ comes into our heart and creates in us a new heart and new life the first time he comes in. And if a common person had grace, <laughs> he'd be a Christian because, you know, you can't have grace without being a Christian because that is the essence of grace is the work of the Spirit of Christ in our heart. It's salvation. By grace are you saved through faith. And to say that common people have a grace, no, what do you see? He's confusing mercy and grace here because, see, common people have God's mercy to them. Just like in the Old Testament, you know, his love on us. You know, when I was out in the world of sin before I received Christ in my heart, I recognized God's love in my life and everything. I was in church a lot, and I recognized God's love and everything, but it wasn't in my heart, see. I had not received him into my heart, and that's a big difference there. It wasn't grace. It was God's mercy. And also, Andrew Warmick from uh, Colorado Springs has a big ministry. You know, Andrew Warmick, you know, he teaches and preaches. There's two graces also. There, there can't be a grace for the comp. Well, God wants everybody to receive his grace, his work of his spirit in his heart so that they'll be born into his family, you know, by the changed heart and the changed life and his spirit coming in us. But see, that makes a person a Christian then. The instant the Spirit of Christ comes in your heart is when you become a child of God. Romans 8 and 9 says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. See, we're not a child of God. We're his creation, like the rest of his creation. But without his Spirit in our heart, we're not one of his children. And Romans 8 and 9 says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, they're none of his. So if, if a common person that didn't have Christ you know, in his heart or something like that, receive the work of grace, he wouldn't be a common person anymore. He'd be a child of God. So you can't have two graces, one grace. Now, as we grow in grace, as we grow in receiving more of God's word in our heart after we become a child of God, you know, yeah, we're receiving his living spirit into our heart for the, you know, uh, well, promises and things like this, because promises come to us through faith, acceptance of his word into our heart. And we've got to know and hear his word and receive him into our heart. And we're growing by faith and by grace. Because, see, grace is an automatic response in our heart to us receiving God's word positively into our heart. See, grace is the automatic result of when, because as soon as his words come into our heart, he starts working in us. And that's the work of grace then. So, not two graces. Uh, healing heart ministry and back in there, change says the heart grows as you let uh, influence you, and it's not a sudden change. Yes, it is. Man, when the Spirit of Christ comes into your heart and you go from being a lost sinner and He forgives your sins and He erases your sin and He creates in you the clean heart, a new heart. Uh, and then puts his spirit of love in you where all you've had before is hate and lust and everything in your heart, there is a change. There is a change. And it, it is something that you won't be able to deny ever the rest of your life when you receive that new heart and everything. Robert Morris down in Gateway Church said, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. No, And that Noah was saved by grace. No, he wasn't. He was saved by God's um, love and everything, but it wasn't grace, a work of God's Spirit in his heart. It was God's, well, like it said in Isaiah, where he said that, you know, he put his Spirit on them and his uh, words to them. He was saved by his acceptance and obedience to God's Word to build that ark, and he worked throughout that time and everything. But now, just like Abraham, it said, you know, his faith, his acceptance was counted as righteousness and things like this. See, but it was external to their hearts. And, that, and that's what God wanted to change when he uh, uh, changed the covenant. God made a new covenant for us and everything. And let's see, Clef Low Dollar says that uh, grace is holiness. Grace is not holiness. Grace produces holiness. But see, when we receive God's love and his words into our heart and they come alive in us and start creating in us and changing our personalities and changing us inside like this and like that, sure, as we respond positively to God's word and accept him into our heart and that, that work of his love then in our heart, work of grace, does create holiness in us as a uh, response to it. But grace is not holiness. Grace produces holiness. Uh, 
and it's just on and on like this. There seems to be such a confusion between mercy and grace. In fact, like I said earlier, if you look up the definitions in these theological books and everything um, about mercy, it'll use grace to try to explain mercy. And then when you look up mercy, they'll tr they'll use mer I mean, look up grace. They use mercy then to try to explain what grace is. They intermingle them like that because they're not quite sure of that. But uh, here and uh, just recently. The Presbyterian Church of USA took out that Jesus is the only way to get to God or for salvation. Uh, they took the song, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand, All Other Ground is Seeking Sand. And they removed that and all other songs that make statements like that about Jesus being the only way. They, they took it out of their you know, hymn books. And then um, Bob Record, now I'm not, I don't remember for sure who this is, but one of the men on TBN, uh, the preachers said that Abraham was saved as we are. No, Abraham wasn't. Abraham was saved, you know, by obeying God's word and going through the proper, you know, uh, sacrifices and things like that in his life for forgiveness. But all the people in the Old Testament just had mercy and truth, mercy, God's love on and to them and God's word to them. And then they worked out their salvation with fear and trembling by obeying God's word and going through the sacrifice and everything. But God didn't like that particular uh, covenant, so he created a new covenant. And that new covenant then, you know, the, he wanted to put his spirit in us. He wanted a closer fellowship and relationship to us. And also then, Billy Graham, in his last message just a few months ago and everything, uh, when he was talking about the cross, he said that uh, Christ died on the cross and took the hell that we deserve. See, Christ, the living word of God, did not die on the cross. Uh, Jesus, the man Jesus, died on the cross. The man Jesus uh, cried out when the Spirit of Christ left his heart and he took on our sins on the cross. The man Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? See, Christ left him. Christ, the living word that Jesus was filled with the work of grace, the living word, and in, in, in his walk here on earth and everything. He came in the fullness of grace and truth. Well, but on the cross there, see, he took our sins, our separation of the heart from God is sin. So he took those sins when Christ left him on, alone on the cross. And he died then and cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was the man Jesus in that died on the cross, not Christ. And see, confusing this then, it, it leaves people that don't understand, you know, with kind of mixed up what's going on here. You know, Christ died, Jesus died. No, Jesus the man died on the cross for us. And um, that's something we need to be specific about when we're sharing with other people and everything. Like uh, what is it here in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Um, and then um, Philippians 2, 5. Oh, excuse me, Philippians 2, 9. Wherefore God also has highly exalted Jesus, him, him, Jesus, and given him a name above every name. See, he highly exalted Jesus to the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But see, Christ has always been part of God. You know, in fact, it says in Hebrews 11:26 that Moses deemed the riches of Christ greater than all the wealth of Egypt. See, Christ is God's living word. God's living word in Jesus left him on the cross alone and he died for us and was resurrected and exalted to the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So Christ did not die for our sins on the cross. Jesus did. Now I'm going to uh, take a short break and I'll be right back. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern. 
and on Saturday and Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on KLRN Radio and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at r-a-h-a-r-d-i-n dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Each of my programs are being saved so that you can listen to them at any time. There's just four simple steps to find the past programs. Go to www.spreaker.com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. Enter my name, Richard Harden, in the search box in the top center of the home page. Click on the brown icon, which has the Bible, two candlesticks, and a cross in the background. A list of my programs will come up. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Welcome back. I want to continue sharing here about grace and what some of the ministers around our country, and the reason I'm doing this now is not just to criticize these men and everything. It's just that in teaching... We're supposed to be, teachers have more responsibility. And it says in 2 Corinthians 5, um, 19 to 20, that we're going to be ambassadors for Christ. To be ambassadors, to speak his word pure. Uh, we don't have the authority to change his word or anything like this. It's just that we're supposed to speak what he shares with us and what he has shared with us. Um, and so... Uh, I'm not saying these these men are doing these things, you know, intentionally to mislead people. No, because, you know, they're so many of them are so dedicated. They've been serving the Lord all their life. And a lot of people have been saved in their ministries. But what I'm saying is that whatever their ministry effect is now, it could be greater if they were more careful with with how they share these things. Because lost people listening, you know. Well, it just creates confusion when error is being shared in the middle of a good message. And like for an example, of, here's an example of a, a man, uh, Max Lucado, which is one of the biggest men around our country right now, biggest I say, in, in teaching about grace. He's written, oh, I don't know how many books, 25, 30 books, and almost all of them are about grace. And he put out a new book recently. I mentioned one a while ago, you know, that um, had about, 13 or 14 of the top people in our country in different ministries for that book about grace that said there's two graces, uh, 14 or 15 people in the other large ministries around our country signed on saying how great that book was and everything. Uh, but now uh, Max Lucado has put out a book recently, and he says that grace is more than we deserve, greater than we can imagine. That's about as close as he comes to the definition of grace. Uh, but some of the people that shared that how great his book was and how, how great it affected them in opening up their understanding of grace and, 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 you know, just, you know, people should read his book and everything. One of them was Dr. Charles Stanley, uh, Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, Joyce Myers, Cal Thomas, and just many, many others, about 10 or 15 more. And these people, you know, are sharing how great his book is, and his best, you know, understanding of it is more than grace is more than we deserve, greater than we can imagine. Now, on page 10 and 11 of his book, it says that grace is not a response to a snap your finger, you know, like that, or some kind of religious chance, or a secret handshake. It said grace won't be stage managed. 
you know, and how you receive grace or something like this. And then he says, I have no tips on how to get grace, but it can sure get us. Now, here's a man that's written many books, and this is a top seller on the New York Times bestseller list now for Christian or religious books, and, and, and all these other books on grace. And then he comes along right in the book, and he says, I have no tips on how to get grace. Then he goes on to discuss the prodigal son and things like this and everything. But now, take a look at that. No tips on how to get grace? I can share with you right now the only way you can get grace. There is something you must do for it. You know, most people say grace is God's unmerited favor. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you, you know, you can't earn it and everything. Now, you can't earn it, but there is something that you've got to do. You've got to accept and receive God's word into your heart because his word is alive and his word comes into your heart then and performs a work of grace. By grace are you saved through faith. Now faith is acceptance and obedience to God's word. When God teaches you you're a sinner and you reject it and say I'm not a sinner, you can't get saved, see, if you don't reject that part of God's word into your heart. If you reject God's word into your heart, you're a sinner, okay. Now what? What I do with my sins? You know, where do I go? What do I do? A lot of people turn to alcohol, drugs, sex, other things, power, and everything. But no, the scripture teaches that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He said, Oh, I've got a. Jesus will take care of my sins. But then some will say, I don't want to be one of Jesus' freaks. No, no, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. You can't get saved then. But see, once we recognize our sin <clears throat> and that Jesus is the only way to satisfy our sin, then what do we do about it? Romans 10, uh, 9 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we have to turn then and turn to the Lord and actually do something to receive grace. You do have to do something. You have to humble yourself to God's word at your center, that Jesus is the answer for your sin, and that you must call out to him personally and say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart, create in me the new heart, the new life, you know, and put your spirit into me so that I can become a child of God. See, you've got to do it personally. Nobody can do it for you. In Jeremiah 29, 13, you should... Um, seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. See, it's got a wholehearted, honest commitment to you, to the Lord, asking forgiveness of your sins, inviting him to come in. Now, that is the faith part. You've accepted God's word that you're a sinner. You've accepted Jesus' answer. You've accepted you've got to make the choice now and receive him into your heart or reject him to unbelief. There are no doubters in hell. There are, there are believers. There's people who God's brought to this knowledge of him, him and his love, and they reject unbelief. Now, it's, it's not because they don't know it's true. It's just, I want to wait till I get in college. Wait, I mean, wait till I get out of college. Wait till I get married. Straighten out my life. But see, now, here, Max Licato, who's one of the biggest spiritual leaders in our country, for so many people, he's on every day, I believe, here in town, you know, on uh, TBN or Daystar or something, uh, t Christian TV, teaching about grace. And all these books he's written on grace, and he says down here he does not have any tips on how to get grace. Well, I'll tell you again, you've got to humble yourself to God's word at your center, that Jesus is the answer, and that you've got to make a choice, and you've got to... Um, Talk to the Lord and ask his forgiveness your sins. Now, you don't have to say exact perfect words, you know, like I mentioned a while ago about, Lord, please forgive me my sins, come into my heart and save me and everything. It's great if you know enough about God to do that. But 2 Corinthians 3.16 says, When the heart of man turns to the Lord, the veil of separation is lifted. Some of you out there might have been just so desperate some night at your couch or some, some out somewhere, you know, sitting in your car about to commit suicide, and you turn to the Lord and say, Oh, God, help. See, when the heart turns to the Lord, that's a language God likes to hear. He responds to heart language. It's got to be true from the heart, regardless of what you say. And God will hear and answer. But, it, see, that's the 
It's sad that in our country a guy has been written, writing so many books on grace, got this great book out. He teaches on grace every day, but he doesn't know how people can receive grace. Wouldn't his ministry be so much greater if he just knew that all they have to do is pray and invite the Spirit of Christ to come into their heart? And then when he comes into their heart from an honest request that the work of grace in is when the Spirit, Jesus says, my words are spirit and life, the work of the Spirit in the heart then is the grace for salvation. Oh, now you say, well, how come you haven't told these people that? I've written letters, I've written emails, I've sent books, I've sent messages, and um, most people don't hear little guys like me that just preached in prison the last 30, 40 years, or, you know, just whatever. But anyway, Bible Answer Man, Hank Handegraaff, some of you might know him. Uh, he's more along the line of Baptist, Methodist, you know, the center of the road, you know, uh, type person here. But now, he's on every day in um, most cities, some radio about 5 o'clock in the evening or something like that. <clears throat> he says that um, the infinite God died and suffered infinitely more than any of us could. It was God dying for us and suffering for our sin debt. It was not God dying for us. The Spirit of Christ left Jesus when Jesus called out and said, you know, uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because, see, he took our sins and he took that separation of our heart from God. Jesus had never been separated from his Father. Even in the conception of Mary, the, you know, the, Jesus had the Spirit in him when he was born like that. He, he always had the Spirit of his Father in him until that instant on the cross. And then he performed the, uh, like the scapegoat of the Old Testament sacrifices, he performed that scapegoat function for us because he took on the sins in the total separation of his heart from God, total sin of the world. And that's the way we were born in this life. Our, we had no spirit of God in us. We were in total sin when we were born. And then he took that for us so that he could be, you know, become, you know, our Savior. And then help us to be united with his father and become a child of God. Now, see, we never have that separation again. Once we receive the Spirit of Christ in our heart at salvation, um, like again, Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart also we give you, a new spirit will put in you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you. He creates in us a new, clean heart, and then he puts his spirit in us, and we are never separated from God again throughout eternity. I joined in with God's family in 1974, the spirit of Christ in my heart. I, you know, I become a child of God, and I will always be a child of God. See? I don't have to go through that separation of my heart when I die here. Uh, that's been taken care of by Jesus on the cross. He took that separation there when the spirit left him, and he died on that cross. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He then, see, took that separation of his heart from God like the scapegoat and took it away. We don't have to go through that. And then when he was resurrected, the new life and everything, uh, he was exalted to the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But the infinite God didn't die for us. See, that's uh, that's just... Well, I don't know what you'd call it. Okay. Uh, also, the Bible answer man says here, and uh, I have these dates now when these things were said. And I can tell you the dates and the, the uh, messages and whatever like that. I'm not just making this up. See, I, I, I can give it to you. But he says in the Old Testament, salvation came uh, as after the cross. So he's saying that, that after the cross, you know, after Jesus' death and everything, the people of the Old Testament saved just as we were and everything. Um, then again, down here in another message, we're saved the same as the people of the Old Testament. And, and then another message, all mankind saved by um, grace in the Old Testament, New Testament. There was no grace in the Old Testament. We're not saved like that. And, and many times on the script, you know, on the radio, you know, I'm listening to them like that. People call for assurance of their salvation. And um, this particular time I wrote down, 
all he could say for a person to have the assurance of salvation was, you know, uh, memorize Psalms 51, and um, you can know you're saved. No, no, just let me ask you, if you're not sure of your salvation, think back. Do you ever remember receiving a changed heart? Do you ever remember a time in your life when you just saw your heart full of sin and your life full of sin? And to God, you just call out to him, oh, God, please forgive me of my sins, you know. Uh, come into my heart and do whatever it takes like that, you know. Uh, when I prayed that night, I said, uh, God, if you're really real, like that Bible says, and I'd been in church 20-something years and everything, I said, if you're really real, like that Bible says, and, and you want to have a relationship with me like you had with those people in the, you know, the Old Testament, New Testament, or the New Testament, you know, like that, uh, uh, once it got saved, you know, a personal relationship, you know, uh, become a child of God or something like that, I said, Lord, show me. I said, because I don't want what I've had up to this time, you know, and I just when I was nine years old, gone forward and said, yeah, I love the Lord. I want to get saved and get baptized and everything. And it was no more than just like joining a club, a Qantas club or Boy Scouts or something like this. But I wanted to do it. But anyway, this time, though, when I cried, I asked forgiveness of sin. I said, you know, if you're really real, like the Bible says, I would like to have a relationship with you, too, if it's like that. And I said, but I'm not going to change anything. You know, I was so distrustful then. I said, I, I'm not going to quit smoking, drinking, or anything until I know it's you. But I will. If you show me that you're real, like that Bible says and everything, and I don't want to just go on a feeling. I don't want six months from now somebody tell me I just had an emotional experience. You know, I want to know it's you. And I'll tell you what, my life changed so much. My feeling about cars, those fancy cars I had and everything went away. And um, the drinking just immediately stopped like that. I just forgot about it for a couple of days. And then when I saw the bottle up there, I, hey, I don't need that. I just poured it out. Anyway, and, and on like that, things happened in my life so quick. And I picked up a Bible a couple of days after that prayer and started looking at it. And it just came alive. And I just, I was so excited. I could, you know, couldn't hardly put it down. I just wanted to see what else was in there I'd been missing all these years. But anyway, uh, you don't just memorize a verse to get saved. you got to know you received the changed heart. you got to know that uh, Christ has come into your heart and life, and he forgive you of the sins you ask him to, and he cleaned up your heart and changed all those lusts and everything like that for, for money and greed and everything. Change that to love, and you'll know it, see? Because you ask him to do it. So when he puts his love in you and puts a new heart and all this, you'll know that it happened. And if you don't know that it happened, start praying and seeking until you do. It can happen right now if you just turn to the Lord with honest prayer, asking forgiveness, inviting him to come into your heart and committing your life to him. It's that simple. Now, I just wish everybody could know because it's such a great change. Um, and also the Bible instrument here says that Christians are all in continuous state of sin all the time. Continuous state of sin. The sin is separation of heart from God. My heart will never be separated from God again since 1974 when he came into it. See, now Christians do commit acts of sin. Now, you know, a Christian can kill somebody. A Christian can, you know, uh, cheat somebody or do this. So acts of sin... But a Christian cannot be in a state of sin. Let me read you here what it says in the scripture. 1 John 3, 6. 1 John 3, 6. If you don't write that down. It says here, Whosoever abideth in him, God, or in Christ, or, you know, whichever, whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither knoweth him. Now, wait a minute there. If he's saying Christians are bad in a state of sin, that means they haven't seen God and haven't known him, according to this verse here. But see, what it means is that separation of our heart from God. Christ comes into our heart, and he's in our heart as a Christian. Now, I can, you know, have a bad thought of lust. I can, you know, go out and, and shoot somebody today. I can go out and, you know, steal something today. These are acts of sin. These are acts of evil. But I can't ever separate my heart from God. Jesus says he won't lose any of us. Because, see, we are in the family of God now. We're children of God. I can be a dis disobedient child, but I cannot back out and say I'm not a child. Just like you can't say right now that your mom and dad is not your mother and dad, and it'd be true. See, you're a child. And that's what the Scripture's saying here. It's saying, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. 
whosoever sinneth not, whosoever sinneth, has not seen him. And in First John three nine, whosoever is born of God, see you're born in the family of God. When the Spirit of Christ comes in our heart and forgives our sins, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. See, and the seed is Christ, as talked about in Galatians chapter 3, where it says to Abraham, uh, he said, and to seeds as of, didn't say into seeds as of many, but he said the seed of Abraham, which is one, and that seed is Christ. Christ in us, our hope of glory. We're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And it's when that seed came into Mary from the angel speaking God's pure word to her, the seed then impregnated her. And then Jesus was born from the seed of God speaking through that angel. Now, whosoever born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. See, see, we can't sin even if we wanted to. Now, but I don't want my heart ever separated from God again. I, I, that's, that's what Jesus died for. He took our sins on the cross, the man Jesus, and was exalted to the fullness of Godhead bodily. So it wasn't God dying on the cross. Christ didn't die for us. Jesus did. Be specific. Don't just say Christ died. Now, today, Jesus and Christ are one and the same. That's why in the New Testament a lot it says Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus in, in times when it um, should just be the man Jesus, like in uh, Hebrews 13 where it says Jesus Christ the same yesterday today and forever no it was Christ the same yesterday today and forever because Christ was in Moses life where it says in Hebrews 11 6 and uh, Moses esteemed the riches of Christ greater than all the wealth of Egypt see in 1 Corinthians 1 24 uh, Paul says Christ is the power of God the creating power of God and Christ is the wisdom of God the wisdom of God his spoken word is Christ uh, and his pure spoken word is Christ. The, uh, and that's why we shouldn't change God's word any, because if we change any of God's word, it's not Christ anymore. It's not the living word of God then. It's our word, and God won't back that up. He'll back up his word. But Christ, the power, creating power, God spoke, let there be light, and Christ, the power of God, went forth and created light. See, now, so, so I don't, ever want to be in a state of sin again my heart separated from God and I won't be because we receive the spirit of Christ in our heart at salvation and we have then Christ in us we're God's children for the rest of eternity you know I might do bad things create acts of sin see acts of sin is different than sinning I am not a sinner now I have do acts of sin and for those I have to you know turn to the Lord and ask forgiveness and, and you know continue on you know to be a obedient child like in well, let's see, what is it? Uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 10, 11 says, Forgive others, lest you give Satan advantage. See, when, when we're disobeying God and, and not forgiving someone, we're giving Satan advantage in our life to bring in sicknesses and curses. Our hospitals would just about be uh, at least halfway emptied across our country if all the Christians were to pray and ask forgiveness for um, them, you know, holding unforgiveness against someone. So many people are in hospitals today because they have unforgiveness in their heart. All they got to do is get that right and get out of there. But uh, Satan has advantage in their life, like uh, Ephesians 4, 26, 27. Be angry, sin not, let not the sun go down in your wrath, neither give place to the devil. So you're giving place to the devil when you have that anger and bitterness. And the root of it then, the root of bitterness can harm a lot of people in your family and friends if you carry that around for somebody. Because you're missing blessings, you're missing you know, answers to prayer, you're not being the person God wants you to be. And so everybody's suffering, not just you. And like in... Um, 1 Peter 3, 7, Husbands, dwell your wives according to knowledge, being joint heirs of grace of life, as into the weaker vessel, lest your prayers be hindered. See, there's a lot of things. Christians can do a lot of acts of sin, but we can't sin because sin is a separation of the heart from God, and we can't separate our heart from God anymore. We, can, you know, Just like you can't say that your mom and dad is not your mother and dad anymore. You will always be their child. And we'll always be God's child. We might not be a good one, but we're always going to be God's child. So um, Christians are not in a continuous state of sin, as the Bible answer man says. Um, and just on and on like this, there's so many people out there teaching things that are right opposite to Scripture. Like uh, 
over one I like to point out to everybody real quick is first John five nineteen, where it says that the devil is in control of this world. And the reason he's in control of this world is because so many people are rejecting God's word, like to forgive others lest you give Satan advantage. See when you give Satan advantage, he's getting control in your life. Because you're blocking God's love to you because you're failing to forgive. And then when you treat your husband's wife, different relationships like that, your prayers are being hindered, you're giving advantage to the devil in your life. See, the devil gets his control because we, as God's people, don't obey his word. So every time we disobey his word or something like that, we're giving him control in our society. And look at all the people in our society that you know, the 60% or something like that, they don't even care about God's Word. They want to get God out of everything, out of their, uh, you know, eyesight, you know, just no mention of God and things like this. They're in complete control by the devil and don't even realize it, don't have any idea that the devil's in control of this world, controlling their lives. And that's why so many people are sick in our country and everything. So, and John three sixteen seventeen. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, Jesus, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now my revision is this, for John three sixteen. For God so loved the people of the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus, that Jesus should endure the loneliness, the suffering of the perfect walk of faith, and the painful sufferings of his seven sprinklings of his blood on the cross, by the crown of thorns, the plucking of his beard, the nails in his two feet, the nails in his two hands, and the terrible stripes on his back, that Jesus would go through all this suffering. God allowed these sufferings in his mercy so that all of God's already pre-elected and predestined people prior to birth to die and go to heaven, that they would actually die and go to heaven. That sounds so ridiculous. If only predestined or elected people prior to their birth go to heaven, then there would have been no need for the work and suffering of Jesus. No one's destiny would or will ever be changed by Jesus suffering and death on the cross for our sins and salvation because everything required for our salvation would have already been done prior to our birth by God's act of electing and predestining us to heaven or hell before birth. After God has predestined us to heaven or hell there would be no need or no more to be done in heaven and earth it would already be finished before our birth. So what's happening here is the devil hates Jesus so much that he's come up with this Calvinist, devilish, deceived theology that would have us think that we're predestined or elected prior to birth to go to heaven or hell, and that would make all the suffering and work of Jesus as our Savior totally unnecessary, totally worthless, and Jesus totally useless. For his life and death on the cross would not change anything prior to, you know, people dying and going to heaven or hell, because it's already been done by God predestining and electing them to heaven or hell before we were born. See how ridiculous that is? Good day. God bless you. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Saturday and Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on KLRN Radio, 
and the Spark Radio Network. Each of my programs are being saved so that you can listen to them at any time. There's just four simple steps to find the past programs. Go to www.spreaker.com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. Enter my name, Richard Harden, in the search box in the top center of the home page. Click on the brown icon, which has the Bible, two candlesticks, and a cross in the background. A list of my programs will come up.